This is our presentation on type checking, and in particular, the subset of duct typing. Type checking is the process which ensures that illegal programs cannot be executed. To do this, a type environment is created which consists of rules defining the type semantics of the language. When an expression produces an undefined value or tries to execute an undefined or illegal expression, then the type checker should produce what is called a type error. For example, void functions should not be able to be added to integers, since these are two opposite types and it is not possible for these types to yield a valid result when used with the binary operator of plus. There are two different forms of type checking, static and dynamic. The main difference between static and dynamic typing is when the type checking occurs. In static typing, the check will occur during compile time, while with dynamic typing, the type checking will happen at runtime by throwing a runtime error. There are advantages and disadvantages associated with each type of type checking. To start with, in static typing, since the program is checked at compile time, there will be fewer runtime errors since the majority of the type errors would have been thrown when the programmer compiled their code. Furthermore, the programmer can rely on the fact that there are guaranteed return types. For example, if a programmer is writing a program in order to determine whether an animal is a dragon or not, and there is a function within the program called isFireBreather that is of return type boolean, the programmer knows that this function will always return a true or false as to whether the animal that is passed as a parameter into the function breathes fire or not. The programmer can use this information in order to determine whether the animal in question is in fact a dragon if the function returns true. On the flip side, with static typing, the program does take a longer time to compile and it is harder to reuse code. Returning to the earlier example, say there is another function in that same program that determines whether a given animal is a that determines whether a given animal is a dragon or not, that is called get weight. In static typing, the only type a parameter that can be passed to this function is an object of type animal. However, say, the programmer wanted to find out the weight of a specific body part of the animal, then they are unable to pass the function as an object of any other type. It also takes longer to compile a program with static typing since a lot of the type checking is done at this point. Dynamic typing takes a much different approach, where all the type checking occurs during runtime. Therefore, it has a much faster compile time, and the programmer can more easily manipulate the program semantics without major changes to the code. However, with great power comes great responsibility. In static typing, the programmer is like Thor, just learning how to use and manage the skills and abilities given to him. But with dynamic typing, the programmer is more similar to Iron Man, where they are creating new powers and constantly expanding their abilities. The programmer is solely responsible for ensuring that the program is well typed when it runs. Dynamic typing also does not have many of the drawbacks that static typing does. One of the main advantages of dynamic typing is that code can easily be reused. Returning to the previous example, program that determines whether a given animal is a dragon or not. With dynamic typing, the functions would be a lot more flexible. The get weight function would readily accept any sort of object that is passed to it, an animal, a leg, or even a rubber duck. The function could be reused multiple times in order to measure these different objects, rather than having, a, having to write different functions for each different type of object. While the programmer is able to use the get weight function to get the weight of any object that is passed to it, the programmer has the responsibility to make sure that the parameter passed to it does in fact possess a weight. For example, the programmer cannot pass an intangible object, such as a number or a fleeting thought. The function would not know how to handle this object, and this could lead to unexpected results in the program, such as a segmentation fault or returning a value that is not a weight. The type system being discussed today, duct typing, is a flavor of dynamic typing. 
Duct typing is a form of dynamic typing that applies specifically to methods within objects. Duct typing follows the mantra, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, then it is treated like a duck. Essentially what this means is that as long as the method exists in the object, it does not matter what the object is or what the method returns. Say we have a program that calls the method fly of an object duck. When running the program, the only type check that is done is to check for whether the method fly exists in the object referencing it. As long as all the methods called are defined within the object being called, then we consider the object to pass type typing checks. Returning to our duck object, if we were calling a method to do Fourier transform with a duck as the calling object, then a type error would be thrown, since do Fourier transform is not a method in the object duck. However, if the method has feathers was called with the duck object, then no type error would be thrown, since this method is a method within the object duck. Duck typing allows for a lot of flexibility within a program. As long as the object exists and the method is in the object, then the program can be executed without any problems. However, this puts a burden on the programmer to correctly use objects and in turn methods. For instance, a program could have the object wolf and the object duck. The wolf object could glue feathers to itself, and so when the method has feathers is called, no error will be thrown alerting the programmer to the fact that there is a wolf about to ravage the program. However, when the method has feathers is called, it is at this point that the wolf will reveal itself. The function has feathers that was called is not the expected one that returns true or false attesting to the fact that a duck does indeed have feathers, but rather one that calls other functions in the program and changes the values of all the variables that exist in the program, completely destroying all the information that the programmer has so carefully carefully designed, and it doesn't return the expected boolean, but rather does the unthinkable and returns nothing. With duck typing, method calls and the return types of the methods are not guaranteed to behave in the same way every time. Unexpected types could be returned from the method. Side effects such as other function or method calls within the method could also occur. A language that implements duck typing is weakly typed. Weak type checking does not prevent type errors from being executed. In contrast, a strongly typed language will prevent all type errors from being executed. Strong type checking can occur any time during compile or runtime. We have cannibalized the smaller language in order to implement duck typing. Here we define the syn basic syntax of our language. We have a subset of expressions that can be variables, integers, functions, function applications, objects, get fields, or type errors. Our terminals are values, which can be integers, functions, or objects. The language given above implements class-like objects where the programmer is able to access a method within an object with the get field expression, where a field f is called from the object, object e1. Our main focus with this language is the type checking. As can be seen in the given syntax, a type error is an expression that can be thrown at runtime. A type error occurs according to the duck typing philosophy, where a, duck, a type error is thrown only when a method within a calling object does not exist. Our first rule states that we substitute a value v2 for x in e1. Functions are called by value, which means that an argument that is passed as a parameter, parameter to a function is evaluated to a value before the function is called. The value v2 is then substituted for the variable x in the expression e1. As defined by our syntax, this rules for function applications where v1 is the function that is being called and v2 is the argument to the function. If v1 is not a function, then a type error is thrown. This simply states that we step on e1 until it reaches a function value, whereas this one also states that we step on e2 until it is a value that can be evaluated. The following three rules are the most important ones that are for our implementation of duct typing. First, there is a check that the object v0 is in fact the, an object that we can access the field, or rather method f, from it. If it does not exist, or is not an object that is, or is not an object, then a type error is thrown. After the check on the project, the step evaluator then moves on to accessing the field method from, at, from the object v0. As seen by this rule, if the field does exist, then the values associated with f is returned. However, if the field does not exist, then a type error is thrown in accordance with the third rule. 
it is important to note that no check is done on the return value v of the method f. This next rule simply states that for get field, evaluate or step on expression e0 until it reaches a value. Expressions stored in objects should be values, so step on them until they become a value. If this doesn't happen, then we throw a type error. We also want to make sure that if we find a type error in the field, then we should return a type error, so that we're not passing type errors through our program. The final two type error judgments state that if we have a type error on one side trying to be trying to assign to E2, we should throw a type error because type errors should be propagated through and we want to make sure that all type errors are taken care of. So that's what these two rules make sure. Here we have a simple example of our duct types language. We begin by creating two objects, quacker and walker. The main difference between the two is that walker.getWeight returns, takes a parameter that is an object and returns a method called from that object. Then we create local variables x, assign the value 50, y, assign the return value from quacker.getWeight with x as the parameter, and z, assign the value of walker.getWeight with the parameter quacker, which is an object. When we return from the function, we evaluate y, which simply, re simply replaces occurrences of y in the function definition with the value x, and evaluate the expression to return 60. Then we get the value of z, which replaces occurrences of x with the object quacker in the function definition. This is the heart of duct typing. In this case, we simply check to make sure that getWeight is implemented by the quacker object. Then we call that function and evaluate it to get the value 20. The final return value is then simply 60 plus 20, which evaluates to 80. This concludes our video on duct typing. We would like to give special thanks to Professor Chang for his help in developing our language definition.